So, last time we spent most of the class talking about conservation momentum of fluid in the fracture, and we basically, if you make the simplifications down to one-dimensional flow and incompressible and other things, then you can get it down to, you know, you can basically simplify the Navier-Stokes equations to the point that you can solve them in one dimension for a constant pressure gradient. And, and then you have basically an expression. If you integrate then that over the width of the fracture, you have an expression for velocity uh, as a function of pressure gradient. And it sort of looks like Darcy's law, right? Yeah. So we also wrote down, we didn't do anything with it, but we wrote down uh, conservation of mass in a fracture at fixed height would look something like this. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, in 2D. So we wrote that down. Um, if it's incompressible, so when we were making those assumptions to get to solve the Navier-Stokes equations or reduce them down, we made the assumption it was implicit in there that the fluid was inc incompressible. So another way to say that the fluid is incompressible is that the density doesn't change, right? Um, so if, if, if the density is a constant, I can pull it out of all those derivatives, right? Pull it on the outside of the derivatives, and then if I can do that, then I, then I can just cancel them, right? If they're constant, then I just cancel density, all right? And so that would be conservation of mass for a single phase incompressible fluid. Um, now, you know, what we're working towards here is something we can actually code up and solve in this class, okay? So, you know, that's the general sort of planar model in, in, in 2D, but uh, so thinking about a homework assignment that would be you know, something that you guys could actually work, uh, I said, I, I came to the conclusion that maybe it's better to just stick to 1D, right? So uh, if we're just going to look at a fixed height fracture propagating in one direction, then we're not worried about the fluid flow in any other direction. So we're just going to, this, this, we're going to cancel that term because we're only going to look at 1D, all right? So now we're only, we have a conservation of mass in one, dire in one dimension, right? in the x direction only. And then now we have an expression from last class for the velocity in the x direction, right? As a function of pressure. So we have that. So now I can plug that in here to get this equation. Now, for now and for basically, we're going to now, well, let, let me just one, one last time. Let's expand this. So I'm going I'm to distribute the derivative. Um, the 1 over 12 mu is a constant, so I'll pull it out. Minus 1 over 12 mu. Then I have. guy. Okay. 
then uh, can we solve that equation? There's two unknowns, right? Pressure and width. There's only one equation. So we need another equation. If you remember, we, we have one that was like uh, the width of x and y is equal to the integral over the surfaces of the times some elastic function of x and y and x prime and y prime convolved with p of x prime, y prime, d x prime, y prime, d y prime. So that's our other equation. But before we sort of get to that, I mean, we're gonna, let's, let's go ahead and, and discretize this thing. So, so again, we're working toward something we can code up and solve. Right? So this is a partial differential equation. Right? It's partial because it has dependence in space and time. Okay? So we need to discretize this in, uh, in some way in space and time to make it a set of you know, if we, if we discretize in space, then we have an ordinary differential equation in time. And then we can discretize in time, and we have a set of algebraic equations. Okay. So uh, I just want to stop. I mean, this, this equation combined with that one is, in general, you know, how, how to solve in 1D. We're going to ignore leak off. So I'm, from here on out, that's going to be 0. But uh, just in general, and it's actually no more difficult to add it. It's just the homework assignment that I have in mind for you guys is I want you to compare it to the KGD solution. And so we're going to solve this numerically, and then I want you to c compare that to the KGD solution. And the KGD solution uh, we're also ignoring leak off, right? So okay, so we're gonna we're gonna ignore this guy from here on out. No leak off. All right, and we're going to shift gears for a second. Any have anybody, anybody had res three? You've had res three. Did you have it with me? You were in Dr. Bellhoff's section, but you had it last semester, right? Yeah. Okay, so y this would be very. You'll know this. Um, and uh, anybody else, you, you get a preview of a lot of what you'll see in Res 3 here. Right? Right. So we're going to discretize it with a method. So there's, a, you know, there's a, lots of methods to solve it. So we can solve it you know, probably the best way is with finite elements. Um, we can also solve it with finite volumes, which is just a special case of finite elements. And, and we're going to do it the worst way, finite differences. So it's it's uh, it's not necessarily the worst way. It's just it's it's limited in ac applicability, okay, uh, in the sense that um, you know with finite differences you're you're, you're uh, relegated to regular grids, right? So squares instead of rectangles. You know, basically in one D it doesn't matter. In one D it's they, you know they're all the same sort of. But in in two and three D. You know, if you have complex geometries, which certainly fractured shapes could be complex geometries, then you know you, you would be relegated to having the extents of your fractures just be sort of jagged, jagged edges because you're you're limited to the rectangles, basically. So, <clears throat> so if you've seen this or you remember it, uh, it'll be review. But let's just start with a Taylor series expansion. Right? So let's write out. If we're going to expand a function about a point x plus delta x, then the Taylor series then is f of x plus partial f, partial x, delta x plus 1 over 2 factorial, partial squared f, partial x squared, x squared plus dot, dot, dot. You just, it's an infinite series, so there's more terms here. Right. So, so, what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to solve this equation for this derivative. Okay. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to move that to the other side. Well, I'm going to move this term and those terms to the other side of the equation and divide by delta x. And I'm just, just going to write down the answer. So I did that. Partial x. Partial x equal to f of x plus So as an approximation, so this is, this is exact if I, if I had an infinite number of terms, right? But as an approximation then to the function, I can just keep this first term and I can ignore the root. And I can, you know, we, 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 it, we say it's okay that because, we, you know, we say it's okay that we ignore them because, well, first of all, the, the second derivative of the function it might be small, probably is small. Um, but then also, delta x is something we can con control in our discretization. And if we make it small, if we make it small, this number becomes small. And so what we say is that this, if we ignore those higher order terms, so that we have f of x is approximately equal to f of x plus delta x minus f of x, right? That's, and this has an error that's on the order of delta x. So there's some error that's proportional to delta x. So if we make delta x small, then this goes to zero. The error will go to zero. <coughs> so this is called, so you notice, I took this, you can think of, you can think of this delta x like a perturbation, right? So I, I took the function, you know, I want to know its value of the derivative at x, and I perturbed it in the positive direction by delta x. And so I perturbed that by positive delta x. And so since I went forward, or I went in the positive direction, we call this forward, call this forward finite difference. It's equally valid to make that perturbation backwards. Uh, and so if I were to evaluate a function at x minus delta x, then the Taylor series is f of x minus And if I solve this guy for the function, then that becomes approximately equal to f x minus f x minus delta x over delta x. Right. And that also has an error that's on the order of delta x. Now, I'm not going to work through all the details, but if I took those two Taylor series expansions, the one where I perturbed in the forward di direction and the one where I perturbed in the negative direction, and I subtracted them from each other. So in other words, what I'm going to say is I'm going to subtract the forward difference equation minus the backwards difference equation. And when I say equation, what I'm really talking here is the Taylor expansions. But if I do that, then what I get 
is that partial f of x is approximately equal to f of x plus delta x, f of x minus delta x, over 2 delta x. And this guy has an error of delta x squared. <clears throat> so what this means, the error of delta x squared means that as I make x small, the error goes to zero faster. It goes there quadratically, right? So that's better. This is a better approximation to the derivative than either the forward or backward difference. So you might ask, well, why would you ever use forward or backward when you have this one right? <laughs> And, and here's the thing to remember with all sort of numerical methods, computational mechanics. It's my favorite saying. There's no free lunch. There's no free lunch. So whenever you're doing numerical methods, you're always making decisions to trade off speed, stability, accuracy. You can never have all three. So you know, usually, you know, if you're lucky, you can you can do something that will make two, you know, make it possibly uh, more accurate and more stable at a higher computational expense, meaning it takes longer to run, and and that's sort of what is going on here. So, in the in the first one, the forward or the, the either the forward or the backward, if you had to evaluate a lot of these finite differences, right? If you had to evaluate a lot of them, meaning you know, you, you needed to perturb x plus delta x uh, and evaluate the function at some other point, x plus 2 delta x or something like that. Well, you'd only have to do one functional evaluation at f of x. Right? You, could, you could evaluate f of x and you could store it. And then you could do the, your perturbation. Right? But here, in this one, you'd have to always do two functional evaluations. So you couldn't evaluate it once and store it. At every point you wanted to evaluate, or every perturbation you wanted to evaluate, then you'd have to repeatedly do both calculations. So um, that comes up actually in, in uh, Jacobian calculations a, a lot of times. So that's for um, first derivative. Now, what about a second derivative? So you might, you know, a second derivative of f, you might also just write that like this, right? Partial, partial x of partial f, partial x. Right? Well, you, you have an approximation for this guy. Right? And then we could just use our Differencing scheme again on the on this guy. Right? So what you'd end up with if you do that, you, you'd have something like um, So at first, we'll use a backwards difference approximation for the derivative. Then we'll use, I'm sorry, a forward difference approximation. Then we'll use a backwards difference approximation here. So, so these are just approximations to the derivative. Approximations to the derivative, and then we subtract those two and do that. Well, when you work out, if you were to then just work through all the algebra, what you'd get is okay. So this is for a second derivative. And, and it also has an error on the order of delta x squared. Okay. 
So what we're going to do, now we're going to go back and discretize our equation. And anywhere we see a first derivative, anywhere we see a first derivative, we're going to use a center difference approximation. Because it has a area of you know, delta x squared. And anywhere we see a second derivative, we're going to use this approximation, because it also has an area of delta x squared. So our spatial error will be, you know, proportional to delta x squared, on the order of delta x squared. So, for the moment, our fracture is going to be, it's one dimensional, right? So, it's going to have a fixed height, and it's going to grow in one direction. And in that direction, we're going to discretize it spatially, right? So, we're just going to pick some points. We'll call this point i, and this point i plus 1, and this point i minus 1. So i is the point where we're going to write the equation about. And every point is going to have an equation, but right now we're just going to write the equation. We're going to discretize the equation about the ith point. Okay. And while we don't have to, um, for simplicity, we're just going to assume that there's a constant delta x between all points. That's not a restriction of the method we're using. It's just a, a, a assumption for simplicity. Okay. So in other words, you know, before when I was writing f of x plus delta x, now I'm just going to replace that with f i plus 1, because okay. it's that's the function evaluated at delta x in the, f in the forward direction. So this is uh, the i and i plus 1 is a little bit of a shorthand. Right. So if we go back to our equation, we had this minus 1 over 12 mu out front. That's going to remain there. And then we had the first derivative in space. Uh, the space means with respect to x. Well, the first derivative in space of the width cubed, and that's going to turn out to be problematic later, but we're just going to write it down like that. So the first derivative in space of the width cubed. Right? So what we do, we're going to use a center difference approximation, which would be f of x minus delta x minus, uh, I'm sorry, f of x plus delta x minus f of x minus delta x. And in our notation here, f is the width cubed, right? And x plus delta x is i plus 1. Right? So we're going to say the width cubed at i plus 1 minus the width cubed at i minus 1 all over 2 delta x. And that's going to be multiplied by, now we had a pressure, uh, uh, a derivative in pressure, first derivative in pressure. So that's P at I plus 1 minus P I minus 1 over 2 delta X plus the width cubed, and that's now the width of I cubed times, and we had a second derivative in pressure, second spatial derivative, right, so p i plus 1 minus 2 p i plus p i minus 1 all over delta x squared. And then we had a derivative in time, and for that guy, for the time derivative, we're just going to use a forward difference approximation. And so this is the width at i. And now time, we're going to say time goes from 0 and, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4 to n, okay? And 
one, two, where one, two, three, four just represents steps in time, you could multiply by any. So maybe a better way to write it would be like this. Let's do this. Let's do um, zero H one H two H three H dot 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 N H where H is some small number. Small real number. Real positive number. So N just represents the number of time steps you're taking. How, how much, how far, far you want to take them in time is your choice, and the smaller the time step, the more accurate the solution will be. But we're going to represent that now with a superscript because the, the the subscript re represents sort of the spatial position where we're at along the line segment, right? And the superscript is going to be represent where we're at in time. Okay, so we're going to say the n plus one minus the width of i will be n all over delta t. Actually, so that h actually should be, let's do this, sorry. t equals zero delta t, one delta t, two delta t, dot, 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 n, So now our equation is discretized, sort of. I mean, there's no superscripts on the P's and W's yet in terms of where we're going to evaluate those in time. We'll figure that out later. All right, that, that whole equation is equal to zero. Okay. Well, there's still only one equation. You can't solve it. We have to go back to that integ integral equation. And we're going to cheat. And we're going to use um, method by 